1939. Some of you were undoubtedly in the stands to witness this same tune-up for the running of the Memorial Day Classic at the great Indianapolis Speedway Proving Grounds. Perhaps you'd gone beneath the stands for a moment to refresh yourselves with ice soda and frankfurters. Perhaps a neighbor's chance comment had caused you to turn your head. As roaring at full speed around the turns, drivers Floyd Roberts, Chet Miller, and Bob Swanson were bound together by one moment of tragic impact. Tragic impact that took the life of Floyd Roberts. The final lap, and out comes the checkered flag. And gliding into the pit is the winning car and champion driver, Maury Rose. Water now, champagne later. Remember the last Memorial Day Classic just before Pearl Harbor brought us into the Second World War? Did you see the garage on fire that took the focus of attention off the big race like a dog running across a football field at a tense moment in the big game? High racing hopes, racing cars, and high octane gasoline fuming skyward in the heat of the conflagration. Attention is brought back into focus at the moment a racing car skids and dashes into the track wall. But the race goes on as always. And at last the checkered flag is waved and into the winner's pit comes none other than our old friend again, Maurice Rose. The war is past us and again Saturdays at the beach and the Indianapolis races are back in vogue. They're grinding around the oval again in a familiar pattern. And too in a familiar pattern, death stalks the drivers. Shorty Cantlin, after 40 laps is tapped for his final curtain. Death, not satisfied with the effects of this tragic impact, blows his icy breath on a curved section of track. But maybe it was the hot sun that day in Indianapolis that averted the so near, so close brush with disaster. The drivers all put equal chances on the starting line. Yet some seem to bear a charmed existence. Or maybe it's a number that brings the luck. How about it, Maury? The passing years bring new drivers, eliminate some of the older ones, but always they bring higher horsepower, better tires, improved fuels, and tragedy. Car number 28 is the first of 1949's crop of racers to give in to the rigors of racing. Straining horsepower given its head wide out as the protective barrier again is hit by a racer. The gas flames. There's the hot breath of death, licking out at all who follow. Some of the racers take to the dust. Others of them breast the wall of flames. And at the wrap-up, there's your winner, Bill Holland. watching this year when one of the largest fields ever entered in the race took off and started lapping the great oval course. Did you see them pass the stands in a blue haze of exhaust fumes? Did you see car number 32 set off a chain reaction as it hit the wall, careening into the path of the oncoming field? And see car number 11 as it got into the act. The world's most hazardous race course becomes more hazardous as car number 53 goes into a spin. Numbers 32, 11, and 53 unlucky numbers. But 14 being lucky enough to make the winner's pit. Going back a bit and speaking of luck, it was a lucky cameraman indeed who was on the scene at Tacoma, Washington in 1949 to record the fate of this bridge shown here in the process of building. And it was a thing of spidery beauty when the opening ceremonies were held. 
But due to causes unknown, this man-made thing of fragile beauty reacted strangely to certain conditions of wind set up by nature in the gorge over which it passed. If by chance you weren't in your theater to see the record of the motion picture camera at the time of this occurrence, you can feel you were really there through this strange pictorial display. description. Only the motion picture camera could properly record the great surging, heaving misery of this man-created engineering marvel as it strained in the agony of its tortured steel. Here was an impact tragic beyond words to the architect and engineers and builders of what had been termed the most graceful bridge in the world. Skipping to 1947, and this time ironically to a building burning within a few feet of enough water to drown a continent, we see the impact of fire upon one of the great Port of New York shipping piers. Burning fiercely within sight of the world's greatest audience, the citizens who occupy the upper levels of the world's tallest buildings, the fire gnaws at the hemline of New York like rats at a crust of bread. The site of this burning pile today is occupied by a modern fireproof pier that serves the ships of all the world. Ever been up in a plane to see the effects of a great fire on its victim? Our cameraman was in 1939 when a great grain elevator in Chicago caught fire. And this time they couldn't blame Mrs. O'Leary's famed cow. Let's get back to Earth and see this from close up. Millions of pounds of the golden harvest of the prairie states burned out of existence by the tragic impact of man's friend and enemy, fire. One last exposition of the tragic impact of fire for the fire buffs who couldn't be there that day in 1946, when another great grain elevator, in Minneapolis this time, lost the fruits of its holding to a slow creeping murderous fire that sprang forth in uncontrollable strength to test the mettle of every fireman in the Twin Cities. With extraordinary courage, they fought the belching, fuming monster of the fire until the entire structure began to disintegrate. The voice of the fire is heard roaring strong, feeding upon the moderate northwest winds, building ever hotter and more violent, until with deafening roar, whole sides of the elevator are sucked out by the rush of superheated air. High tragedy to the hungry and starving in the waste and desolation of fire.